Hello, everybody, and good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, the Next Wave webinar series. Today, we're going to talk about startups. Uh, my name is Lee Sessions, and I'll be your moderator. I'm looking forward to exploring this topic with a uh, fantastic group of panelists. Um, this is part of our monthly webinar series, and today's topic is startups and strategics, what works and what doesn't work. And we have a stellar panel that I'll introduce you to in just a few minutes. Um, we have uh, four different CEOs who are from uh, various sectors who have a, an incredible lineup of corporate and, and strategic investors and a wealth of experience that they will share with you in just a few minutes. But I'd like to start by providing a little bit of context for this discussion, and, uh, and then I'll come back and introduce the panelists uh, more properly. Um, so first of all, uh, our latest Keystone benchmarking data shows that um, you know, 77% of the investors are active investors. With a, We've seen a little bit of a move towards earlier stage uh, seed investing by corporates. Uh, over 90% of our uh, investors, corporate investors, take either board or observer seats. 55% take both. Uh, the majority of corporate investors are now asking for information rights, and we've seen a, an uptick in those that are asking for sector-specific ROFRs, uh, rights of first, first refusal. And, uh, and when it comes to performance metrics, 56% of uh, investors are asking or are targeting VC-level financial returns. So that's just a little bit of context. As you know, uh, about 18% of uh, companies in the U.S. Uh, currently have corporate investors. So you know, it's, uh, it's been growing year after year, even with a downturn, that those numbers are staying fairly constant. And uh, so we see that, that corporate investors are quite active in the ecosystem and some of the changes that, that they are uh, uh, starting to look at. So putting this in context with uh, the CBC ecosystem, um, one of the things that we look at in the end-to-end -end kind of process of investing and landing is that oftentimes we have the investing team, and over the last decade or so, we've seen the emergence of the corporate venture business development team, or the landing function, which is an integral part of a professional investing organization. Our latest Keystone benchmarking data shows that 40% of global CVCs have some sort of a dedicated CVBD or platform team. And of those teams, 80% or over 80% offer access to parent partners, networks, and technical resources. About a little over half provide a, a PMO resource and funding for pilots and POCs. And we'll talk a little bit today with these CEOs about their experience of working with startups through pilots and POCs and commercial agreements. Um, those are always uh, an interesting topic to talk about. But um, what's really important in, in looking at this model is that there are hundreds of interdependent relationships that take place over the life cycle of an investment, oftentimes involving external parties uh, with the startups and other co-investors and with different parts within your own parent corporate organization. And those uh, managing those relationships takes a lot of time and effort. Those organizations that do that the best uh, tend to survive and thrive because they're able to harvest the value that comes from managing these kind of complex interdependent relationships that are so important for startups beyond the capital that they provide. We did some surveys some time ago and uh, looked at what are the critical success factors that are required for success between corporates and startups. And from a corporate venture capital perspective, what we found is that the things that were most important from their point of view were strategic alignment with the parent, having kind of alignment with the C-suite, business unit involvement, portfolio engagement, having a mechanism was uh, an important part of, the, of that process uh, for managing that portfolio engagement. And that's kind of looking at the, the, the views that uh, were really important for them to be able to kind of formalize and manage a relationship. But a lot of their focus has been primarily on managing the parent and managing parent expectations. Then we went and asked the same question of startups and startup CEOs. And we said, what is most important in terms of your views of the critical success factors? The things that they said were transparency regarding the CVC's intentions, understanding the corporate parents' vision and plans for the startup you know, offering. Like, do they have a plan? What is their plan? How are they going to actually 
uh, you know, uh, operationalize the, the engagement process with the startup. And uh, so we'll hear a lot about these kinds of things that are really important from a startup perspective. And I'll, I'll just say another thing about our panelists is that uh, these panelists are, are often engaged in every course that the Institute offers because we firmly believe that it's important for corporate venture groups to understand the perspective that CEOs bring and founders bring when they're looking at who to engage with. And at a time when money is still largely fungible, the value beyond money makes a huge difference in startup success. So uh, with that in mind, um, I will uh, next bring our panel on and I'm gonna ask each of them to introduce themselves. We just, uh, we have a, 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 a just a star studded panel here of, of CEOs with a wealth of experience. And I think I will have them introduce themselves. And why don't we start first with Kurt from Sentient Corporation and uh, have him tell us a little bit about himself and, uh, and Sentient and your investors. Uh, thank you, Lee. I'm really happy to be here. Um, my name is Kurt Bush. I'm co-founder of Sentient. Um, Sentient started around six and a half years ago to really move artificial intelligence from something that was largely in the cloud to something that could be in the, in the edge. Um, today, sentient technology is deployed in things as small as hearing aids to as large as automobiles. We have about 50 million units in the field that use our hardware or our software. Um, we're really a, a combined hardware, software, and data company. Really, it's turnkey AI for, for edge devices. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to have a, a good number of strategics um, invest in sentient over the years. Um, we, uh, the, these, these strategic investors include Microsoft, Intel, Bosch, Applied Materials, Motorola, Amazon, as, as well as Renaissance. And we've been, been quite fortunate and have had a, a good long relationship with those strategic investors. So I'm really looking forward to talking to you today with, about this in this panel. Great, okay. Well, I'm gonna ask uh, Say to go next. And I, I knew Say from my days when I was working at Intel Capital and she can tell you a little bit about her experience. Yeah, hi, thank you guys for having me. So most recently, I was founder and CEO of IOTIS, which was acquired by ADT, Inc. Um, it was backed by Intel, as Lee mentioned, as well as Liberty Global and TELUS. And I think one of the things that was very interesting working with those three very large corporate venture groups was that um, as I was exiting my company, they were struggling to find exits for their companies as well, some sort of logical investor returns. And so uh, I launched Azurans right after I left ADT. I was there for about a year and a half uh, and really focusing on startup, M&A, exits, business development around working with corporate partners, some who might be investors, some who might not, and really generating uh, potential interest down the road for M&A, if not going IPO. So those are some of the things that currently focused on would love to talk about over this particular panel and session as well. Okay, great. So, um, Sterling, are you uh, ready to go next? A little introduction. Yeah, Lee. Thank you. Uh, it's always it's always a pleasure to to work with you and the panel on on topics like this. So, uh, I'm a two time entrepreneur. So, I had a company before this that was a successful exit um, that focused on uh, internet and a car, and then now I'm the CEO and founder of Car IQ. So, we've developed a payment network for cars. Had a uh, it simply allows cars to connect directly to merchants and pay without using a credit card. Uh, I started the company about five years, a little over five years ago now. And at that time, a, a vehicle never connected directly to a bank or to a merchant. Um, but today we have tens of thousands of transactions on the platform where cars are paying for fuel, they're paying for tolling. Uh, they're now starting to go into repair services. And, um, and it's pretty cool. And a big backbone of, the, of our strategy is actually this topic, which is Early on, I went right for strategics. We were incubated inside of Citibank. Uh, we then, uh, you know, from Citibank, we learned a lot about how bank networks work, what trust means to a bank. And so the insights that a strategic can provide are immensely valuable to an early stage company, especially to an early stage idea. So thank you. All right. And last but not least, my dad. Yeah, happy, happy to be here. And my name is Maydad. I'm the CEO of the founder of Charge After. Charge After is an embedded lending platform. We connect between banks and lenders to merchants at the point of sale. 
and we enable merchants via one integration to provide their consumers with uh, a full coverage of the credit spectrum, the product spectrum, and their geographical spectrum. And for the banks, we enable them to be connected to the merchants and use our technology in a white label version. And uh, we are working today with in uh, the US, Canada, and Australia with more than 40 banks, including all the leading banks in the US. And from the other side, on the merchant side, we focus on big merchants such as uh, THD, the Home Depot, uh, Lenovo, HP, Samsung, etc. Um, we view ourselves as an industry platform, and because of that, we um, very similar to, to Sterling, we uh, we uh, um, thought that uh, CVCs are are the right fit for us. We have VCs invested in Charge After, but also CVCs, Citibank invested in Charge After, Visa invested. A Synchrony Bank, a US Bank, a Radesco Bank in Brazil, MUFG in Japan. So we are very familiar with uh, uh, corporate investors. So uh, let's start with you. Another question is, when did you start to bring in your corporate investors and, and why do you think that was the right time to bring them in? Maybe you could, you know, obviously they didn't all come in at once, but, you know, t t tell me a little bit about that. What was your approach and, and how did it work? We, we, we started with bringing, we, we actually were, were in a Citibank Accelerator. We didn't take an investment from them at this stage. And funny enough, the first investment came from Synchrony Bank. Um, but we started in round A. And I think that from round A on and, and forward, it's a good time to take investments from uh, uh, from CVCs. You need some some level of maturity, but not too much. Okay, great. And and Kurt, could you tell us a little bit about, you know, what was your approach to bringing in corporate investors? Yeah, so so we started Sentient in, in 2017 um, with this idea to build a new kind of processor. And, and when we told our friends we were starting a chip company, um, they laughed at us and they said, yeah, that's really funny. Um, no one started a chip company in like 20 years. You really should start a software company. Um, little did I know I actually had started a software company. I just didn't know it at the time. Um, but so when we went out looking for investment in the first part of 17, I mean, there's really no companies had made many chip investments. Um, you know, even the companies that did the, the big chip in investments in the early 2000s, largely those VCs that knew semiconductors were, were basically retired. Um, so we, we, you know, we, we eventually got three term sheets, um, you know, from two financials and, and one strategic, and we decided actually to go with Intel Capital um, because they had a probably a you know a few years of insight into the semiconductor company that the financial VCs hadn't figured out yet. Um, you know there was a few fi financial VCs that probably had we just hadn't met them yet. Um, but you know our main reason for for bringing in um, you know a strategic and you know ICAP in the first round was really they saw the need for what we were doing. Um, you know, fast forward five, six years later is now there's lots of VCs investing in semiconductors, but, but in those days it was, it was quite rare and the, the corporates were able to have a little bit better vision because they were, um, in the business, right? So they, they saw the, the day-to-day -day activities in the semiconductor business and saw the need. Okay, great. And say, uh, tell me a little bit about, um, you know, with, with your investors, um, you know, what was your screening filter to look at who, who you brought in and, and what you were looking for in the investors that you had? Yeah, so Intel was the first um, corporate venture in, and they introduced me to actually a fair amount of other corporate ventures because uh, of their connections and network. And I think the biggest thing was that in some ways, I knew that what we were doing was very hard from an operational perspective, that we would need scale, we would need a, a partner in the long term with us um, that could do the operational scaling and really understand that. So there are a few groups like telcos. So TELUS, Liberty Global, were obvious choices for helping us navigate some of those challenges. And so really in my background is very much heavily in telco. So I really kind of aired more towards investors who could help us scale operationally because we had the product, we had the technology, we had the people but we needed that help and really just the, the expertise there. So that's how we went about kind of processing who we wanted to partner with. And we also thought about the exits as well. Like who's gonna block us from exiting? Who's not gonna block us from exiting? And tell us being in Canada, us being a US corporation, Liberty Global being primarily in Europe, we thought those were also safe bets that if you wanted to exit to a, a US company, we didn't have a US, corporate venture who might have blocked that exit as well. So kind of went with the safe 
scalable bet. So. And, and you said help operationally or, or commercially. Did that start before, after, or during the investment process for you? It was after. It was after. So it was one of the more interesting things is that we worked very closely with Telus rolling out in Canada, um, our solution, our um, IoT solution for multifamily uh, real estate, and uh, really kind of started their whole new division uh, for them up in Canada. Wow, oh, okay, that's great. And um, Sterling, how about for you? It sounds like some of your investors are even potentially competitors. So uh, were you working uh, operationally or commercially with, with any of your investors? Yeah, I mean, they could be a, a competitor, but uh, instead we felt they would be a, par a great partner for us. Um, you know, we were solving a problem that they knew existed, but they didn't know how to solve it. So for instance, Citibank said, hey, we know machines will transact and connect directly to banks sometime in the future. Could be 10 years, we don't know. Um, and what they did is they helped me understand the core value, which is simply banks and merchants didn't trust a machine to transact because of credit cards and the KYC process, there was no way to know that this machine is who it says it is. And, and they certainly didn't want to develop software to talk to 65 makes, models, and brands of vehicles that have their own software. So we, that insight really, really helped us. And what it did is it turned those who could be competitors into partners for us. And then since then, you know, a great example is, you know, Visa came on board. Uh, Visa saw the same thing where rather than compete, they said, hey, how do we, how do we turn this into a positive and leverage their identity um, to add vehicles directly to the Visa network, for example? Um, State Farm did the same thing. State Farm said, hey, cars are going to pay for insurance. Their fleet owners already do. Uh, we're feeling some pain because of fraud and things like that. Um, so what we've learned is they'll, the, the, the center point around them is if you solve a problem that they can't solve, suddenly people aren't as uh, competitive anymore and they'll find a way to be a, a partner. In it. That's, that's great. So we already have a, a, a great question starting in the Q&A and I encourage the uh, attendees to put additional questions in the Q&A. But the um, question is, uh, do you find corporate investors willing to invest in pre-revenue companies? My experience is that they want some revenue before they'll in entertain a conversation. So uh, anybody have thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I do. Um, I'm actually, that one's a, a one close to my heart is they will invest in a pre, in a pre-revenue company. What they're looking for is how far along is the product, right? Is your, your first beta product, right? Or your MVP. Um, is it solving a problem that they directly need to or directly focused on? And if they can answer those those basic things, you can actually get an investment out of them. They'll typically do a very light seed round with you and say, hey, we'll, we'll get you started. Or like in our case, we had one that just simply did a pilot with us. So they paid us for the pilot. We, had, we proved out the concept and it allowed us to actually build and validate what we were doing, but they were paying for it and it allowed us to put money in and, and grow the company. So it's very possible. Okay, that's great. Well, and then, um, uh, so another another question here is, uh, um, can corporate venture help startups to enter new market regions in other countries, which the startup may not have access to? Anybody have that experience? Sounds like my dad, you, uh, my dad, you, you had said uh, you've got investors kind of all over, so. Um, yeah, certainly. I think that part of the advantage of working with uh, uh, CVCs is that they they obviously they will it will help you get uh, into business with them. I think that that's the immediate benefit, but also they will help you get into new markets, no doubt about it. Uh, actually, their target as investors, right? And it's very important to understand the motivation uh, of the CVCs of the corporate investors. They are being measured not only on the investment less. Also, but less on the financial side, they are being measured on how 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 beneficial it is to their organization. As part of that, they might help you enter new regions where you are not active, but they are active, certainly. That's great. So you, you each mentioned your corporate investors. One of the other questions is, how do other VCs perceive having CVCs joining the cap table? So I know you manage a lot of complexity with uh, each of you have quite a few corporate investors, but also traditional financial investors. So can you talk a little bit about those dynamics? I'll, I'll start with that one. Um, yeah, so we, we have a, 
you know, probably more corporates than, than financials, but we, we also have financials in the boardroom. Um, and so far we, we've seen it actually work quite well together. Um, we haven't seen any of the conflicts that, that I've been warned about. You know, many, you know, many times I had corporate investors warn me about certain v, uh, financial VCs and I had financial VCs warn me about corporate VCs and, and actually none of those panned out. All of them have played well, very well with each other. Um, and in fact, you know, they, they have also used the opportunity to co-invest in other deals because, you know, they get to go know each other in, in our boardroom and say, okay, I like working with this guy, you know, let's, let's work together on some other deal. Um, and I've seen that happen, you know, many times over, over the years. So I, I think, I think they all play together pretty nicely. That's great. So I'm curious if we get kind of, you know, maybe dip into the weeds a little bit, but how did your best CVC investors set themselves up to work with your company? What did they do to bring you on board? How did they start to engage with you? Uh, I could answer that one. I think for me, uh, I was actually surprised because, and this kind of relates to a question that got put into the chat as well uh, from Paul. So I took the investment first, right? And yes, TELUS also helped me expand into Canada. And then they placed an operational, uh, the president of security and automations onto my board, who I never met during the process of uh, raising diligence, et cetera, because you start getting a strong relationship built with your um, investment team. And they placed a complete stranger on my board. <laughs> and I was very worried, but they're like, no, this is for you, For this is for your best interest to have an operator on your board versus an investment member, team member. And it did pan out that way because he was an amazing board member, just amazing in how we ran together alongside on deploying in Canada. And so um, it was investment first, then uh, operations. You can see it the opposite way as well, where an operator, he could bring in a, a, a potentially the investment team in. Um, I think it, it's always beneficial to have both an operations person as well as investor you know, rowing the same direction. Um, and that really made a difference in how we successfully rolled out and up in Canada. Okay, great. Um, so, um, and we uh, really appreciate all the great questions that we're getting. Uh, other question here from Pearl, you know, when do corporates uh, typically engage in pilot programs, investment ventures, or acquisitions? And, and how can startups discern between these opportunities? So that's kind of a you know, a, a summary of the question, but I'm curious, you know, you've all had customers that are not investors. You've had investors that are not customers, you know, partnerships. Uh, talk a little bit about how, how you've uh, viewed those and, and how they've helped your company or hindered. <laughs> yeah, if you want, um, I think we've had a bunch of those. Um, we've done something with um, uh, with several of the banks. And, and in fact, BlackBerry is probably our most famous one because they actually launched, it led to a a complete product launch at CES. Um, and that one was a really interesting one because it started with the concept of, hey, can we actually manage a payment on a vehicle? And we can we demonstrate how the power of QNX, which is their operating system? So most people think of BlackBerry as the phone, but actually they own 50% of the operating systems for the US or the world vehicle market. So almost 300 million vehicles have their product. And so they wanted to look at innovation and say, hey, could we add features like payments to the vehicle and could we process it? What I liked about it was it was directly in line with our strategy. It was slightly futuristic, right? Being on a car versus going in the aftermarket. But what it did allow us to do is get onto a vehicle, work with their engineering, engineering teams and learn. But more than anything, we actually were able to develop a product with them and then use that product to demonstrate it at things like CES and directly with customers, and it helped us win deals. And the important part about it is when we managed our relationship with BlackBerry, we tried to stay very focused on the things that we could control that were more in line with, with our product roadmap. And by sharing that with them early, we were able to find that middle ground, what was valuable to them, what was valuable to us. And it worked out quite well. Um, had we not had that conversation, I think it could have gone into a tangent where it was more of a proof of concept or something that maybe wasn't as, as, um, as, as likely to be adopted by the industry as, as what we're seeing right now. So I think it's important for people to align with their goals, but also make sure your goals are, are, are attached to that as well. And I personally find 
I personally find strategics to be very um, to be very easy in that area. They want to see you win. They just want to prove something out and say, is there a willingness? Does this work? Do customers want it? And then they want to go into a pilot with it. And I think that's the other thing that, that I would recommend is if you go down this path, don't just take the win as getting an investment or doing some co-development. Try to work with them on a roadmap that says, if we do this, it'll lead to a pilot or it'll lead to a customer engagement because then everybody wins along the route and they'll come back and want to grow the program. Yeah, and maybe I see you nodding your head there. Is that something that you've experienced as well? Yeah, we, we have many uh, CVCs and they are some of them are clients as well. Some of them are just investors. They are, they are big part of them are competing with each other. So it's it's something that you need to manage, right? And you need to to understand. First, I think that it's important to understand that CVCs are strategic investors, and as such, uh, you need to, in some cases, when they are competing and when you don't necessarily want to expose to uh, the board um, the win and the details of the deal with one in one uh, CVC to the other CVCs, so they have some limitations on the uh, information that you're sharing with them. I also think that uh, um, in the investment is only the first uh, the first stage. Certainly the target is to, uh, or the opportunity is to work with those big corporations. It's their target and your target, right? It's, it's target from both sides. It's important to understand that from their side, if they are not working with you, they won't follow up in, uh, you know, in future role, um, rounds. Uh, Starling just related to that, and I agree, and I, we see it in, in in rounds afterwards. If the CVC is working with us, they will invest again. If they are not, it will be harder. They might invest, but it will be harder. So it's an opportunity for a pilot. It's an opportunity to, uh, for them to become clients, uh, but you need to know how to manage it. No question no, about great. it. So yeah, what, what it's a segment by itself. One of the things that we're seeing is this kind of rise in what the Europeans call venture clienting, where you know essentially you're you know you work with corporates, but they're as partners, commercial agreements, but not as investors. So I'm curious, you know, what your thoughts are on the panel in terms of, you know, uh, you know, why is it important to have corporates as investors versus partners? I maybe I'd start a little bit there. Is is that you know, if you, if you look at any kind of engagement, I mean, we're, we're, what we're in, engaged in here is businesses and, and businesses run on cash. So if, if any kind of engagement is going to take a, a great deal of time and, and time is money and the and time is kind of the enemy of startups is, you know, we try to spend the least amount of money and get the most amount of revenue um, as possible. And if so, we're if so, if we're engaged with with a corporate, we really need to have a good um a good outcome of, you know, where, where is that going? Is it going to an investment? Is it going to revenue? Um, and then, you know, from the previous question, we talked about POCs and pilots and whatnot. Um, I'm always a little bit worried, you know, wary of those in that they can take a lot of time. Um, and if they don't have a, a clear path to revenue, um, you know, we've, we've been you know, engaged in quite a few of those, um, but the ones that we've seen are the most successful is when we engage with the, the CBCs Salesforce and we go into an account together. So the it's it's not just a pilot, it's a customer. And and you know, more often than not, you know, the they have more product to offer than we do. So they will get, you know, maybe 80% of the revenue of this customer and we get 20%, but it's still very self-contained and it's leading to revenue for both of us. And I think that any engagement, whether it's with investment or without investment, that doesn't lead to a revenue outcome for for at least for the startup probably for both. Um, I think we need to be very wary of those, those sorts of things because they can take a lot of time and, and they often don't have the same sense of urgency or, or even the concern about runway that, that a startup would have. Yeah. yeah, and I'll add to what Kurt's saying. Um, I wholeheartedly agree. I think there were very um, interesting points in our relationship with our uh, um, corporate venture groups where they wanted us to expand into areas that we thought would be very difficult for us to expand into, do pilots. And uh, a group like Liberty Global, they own so many telcos in Europe, um, all over Europe. And we knew that the market size didn't make sense for us to enter, right? For those kind of pilots with uh, 
one of their telcos. And so we politely declined most of those opportunities because as Kurt's saying, it's like the revenue just didn't make add up. So uh, Telus made a lot of sense. Canada is a huge market for us. It makes total sense. It's easy for us to deploy. They already had uh, their core business. We're just an add-on. I totally agree. Like we are just a, you know, they're taking maybe 60 to 70% of that revenue. And we're an add-on component that is expanding into new market, adding on to um, some of their core offerings. And that made a big difference in, in what we needed to do. And they also had underlying technology to answer Brent's question in Q&A of um, connectivity that we needed and allowed us to have um, essentially connectivity in other places like the US for a much more reasonable cost. So I think those are the kind of key decisions you have to make if you're going to put on, put them on your board, put them on your cap table. Like what are the benefits of actually partnering, going to market with them versus just taking investment? Yeah. Yeah. And, and sort of following on C, the, the thing I've learned from all of ours as well is similar to that is the value of executive sponsorship. So if you have them join your board, you know, A, they're signing up to be an executive sponsor in the company. Because one of the one of the biggest challenges that an early stage company has is how do you navigate these large corporations and how do you find the right fit within a group that's aligned with what you're doing? And you can waste a lot of time doing that. We've experienced that before. So when you have a really good board member, they're going to help you with that sponsorship, find you a place to go. And as he said, They'll keep in line with where your future outcome can be. Is there is there revenue at the end of this cycle? Um, and so we really focus on that when we look at a strategic investor, which is who is it we're directly working with? Can it lead to a project? But more importantly, can they help us navigate this organization, both on the positive side of finding something to do together, but also if there are challenges or how we need to learn that organization, who the players are, how do we develop relationships with the top? that sort of thing have become really, really important for that person to, to help you with. Yeah, so it sounds like the uh, having aligned interests suggests that the CVC should be the board member versus a, uh, an advisor. So- Yeah, uh, very much. And I'm curious, um, you know, in terms of, you know, there's, there's some complexity involved and a lot of steps involved in successfully navigating a corporation. And I know in many of these corporations, you know, it's, um, you know, there, there's, there's multiple layers of people that you're working with over time, you know, years. And, and most of you had, you know, investors for five years now. So what did this, the best strategic investors do to collaborate with each other or, you know, with their corporations to make sure that you were connecting with the right people at the right time and not kind of, you know, running down a, a tunnel that didn't have any cheese? Uh, you meet with them fairly frequently. Visa is a great example. It's a massive company, right? Um, they have one. They have more people in one small division than we have in our entire company. But what they do a really good job of is they 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 put leadership in place with us right away. So a program manager, if you will, um, and what that allows us to do is communicate pretty frequently about what we're working on, some things we maybe could use some help from the from the CBC on. And then they quarterback who we can talk to and how we should talk to them. And that, to me, really, really helps make the program successful. Our relationship with Visa has grown exponentially simply because of that. Um, and same with Citibank. The same thing, you know, big banks, you know, the theory is they move a little bit slow. But on the other hand, they'll give us insight and then tell us who to talk to. And that relationship actually helps us, A, learn more, and then B, move faster with them. Um, so I find that to be very valuable. Without that, I feel like you would flounder pretty quickly in the process. And uh, I'm, I, a question for Kurt, I'm, I'm curious because, you know, as your company has grown over time, have there been different things that you've needed from your investors, you know, in your earlier days versus kind of more recently? And, uh, you know, kind of how do you manage your, your changing needs with, with this diverse group of investors that you have? Sure. So, I mean, it really has been a, a journey. I and mean, when, when you start off, you know, we, we had CVCs in the, in the A round and, you know, lar largely what we needed then was cash. Um, and, and now many of these, these companies have actually become customers. And, and when you asked us, you know, what does a, a good CVC, you know, do is, is that they often have access to the highest levels of the company. 
So, you know, when my sales force is selling to, to one of our investors, um, they're often selling to a, a design engineer or an engineering manager or director. And, and, you know, often, you know, I often say people, no one ever wants to buy from a startup. So you have to offer something truly extraordinary. And, and one of the things that the CBCs that, that are good at it have good relationships at the very highest level, either CEO level or the, or the direct reports to the CEOs that you can go in and pitch to them why they should be buying your product as well. Um, so those, you know, it, it has really kind of changed from, you know, a source of funding and advice to, to you know, how do we help build the business? And then some of them um, that we're, we're probably even the closer aligned with, um, we're engaged deeply with their sales force. So we, we do daily account calls with them. And, uh, and that's, that's been awesome because, you know, a, a 70 person company only has a, a so far, you know, so big sales force. But if a, if a company is, you know, 70,000 people, their sales force is quite a bit bigger and, and has a lot more foot, feet on the ground. So, you know, if you can leverage those things, um, it, it really can help accelerate your business. Yeah. And, and Kurt, I know you and actually each of you have several investors that have some sort of a platform team where there's actually dedicated resources besides the person that did the deal whose job it is to try to help, you know, manage that web of relationships and make those introductions. Uh, anybody have, uh, you know, uh, an, an example of how that process has, has worked for you and with your company? I can take that one if no one else wants to. Uh, but, yeah, please. Okay, sure. So, so a couple of our investors have, have these, these formal business development processes. Um, some of them are, I mean, actually, and in, in we've seen turnover in that over the, the last six years of, of, you know, how much focus and then who the person is and, 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 you know, who our main contact would be. And when the, the contact understands our business well, um, it works beautifully. And when the, the contact doesn't understand our business, it doesn't work nearly, nearly as well. So there definitely is, is some, some, you know, matchmaking, I guess. And I guess my advice to other CEOs with CVCs is if the match isn't good, you know, raise your hand and say, look, I need a different person um, because a really good one is, is extremely valuable. And then, you know, some of them take the approach of making you successful within their company. So they go and find homes for you, for your technology. And others make you successful within their customer base. So they these these platform teams have different, um, you know, probably different charters and in in different focuses, but they are they are quite useful. And I find them more on the the CVCs that have dedicated investment arms, um, as opposed to ones that just the ba balance sheet they just invest off the balance sheet with a product line that says, okay, this is interesting, let's put five million bucks in. Um, but the the ones that have dedicated dedicated um, investment arms such as M12 or Alexa Fund or Bosch Ventures or, or you know, ICAP or so, so, so on, those have these more developed BD functions and I, I definitely recommend taking advantage of them. That's great. So I wanna yeah. shift, oh, go ahead, Sterling, please. Yeah, I think, you know, Kurt brings up a really important topic I see from the questions. This actually is, it's actually kind of important what he's saying is there are two types of, of CVCs, right? Those who invest from a venture group or a venture fund and those that invest from the balance sheet. We typically see the ones that invest from a balance sheet are much more um, focused on, hey, I just want to, they're, they're more opportunist. Hey, I just want to get a front row seat and watch what happens and see if I can use this in the future. Whereas the venture groups tend to be much more process oriented. They put a champion in place or executive sponsorship they'll try to align you with the goals of the company um, because there the venture arms responsibility is to turn this into something important for the corporation. And so you get two different flavors from this group. Um, we tend to have more success with the strategics that have the, the venture arm um, because they help us align our goals. But we do have a few that have invested off their balance sheet and they're good relationships, but they're more of a one-time investment and then they typically don't follow on as well. Yeah, I would echo um, Sterling's point as well as Kurt's is that doing your diligence and somebody asked about this as well as getting to that exit, um, the groups that have dedicated venture arms, yes, they have a process in place. They already know what they're trying to get out of it. They want a return on investment because their group is also, you know, that's their metric. That's their goals. And so we found that those groups are actually better and then they are also better at handling or navigating 
when you need to exit, right? Or when you want to exit when you've been approached uh, for uh, by other corporates for um, acquisition, they actually have lots of back channel connections with PEs or board members or et cetera, et cetera, that know a lot about what that acquisition is going to look like, what their negotiation points are, how they're going to negotiate against you. So TELUS had just bought the Canadian branch of ADT when ADT approached us for acquisition, right? So like six months after they bought a, a, a portion of ADT, ADT approached us for an acquisition. So um, our board member knew exactly play by play how things were going to go. They knew the legal counsel, right? The in-house legal counsel and how the legal counsel would negotiate for certain terms, et cetera. So I think that's something that's like kind of critical in your understanding of um, navigating the CBC world. There are very, very solid groups who've been investing that that is their whole focus within the corporate world versus just like, like Sterling said, like a one-time, hey, let's see, just throw some spaghetti on the wall and see, let's see how this pans out. That being said, I think those groups that are uh, have a formalized process for investment are not necessarily there to acquire you, right? That's not their goal. So that's a different group altogether. Like Intel has a M&A group. And it was interesting because Intel M&A group actually invested in us, not um, ICAP initially. And so we had to go back and like, what are your intentions? Are your, we've been approached a couple of times for acquisition, went to all my investors and said, what are your intentions? Are you guys going to let this through? Are you going to bid against it? What are your intentions? And be very clear about that. Uh, right from the get-go. That's great. Yeah, and, and just to follow on, there's actually a, a third group we haven't talked about here that C is bringing up, which is there are strategic venture groups that come from corporate funds. So for instance, like with ours, we have a group called Forte Ventures, and they actually came from Siemens and another group. They think just like a corporate CVC, um, but they do the back office stuff that's really important. They introduce you to other funds. They introduce you to other strategics. But they're thinking all the way through, of how do we help you integrate with a, with a corporate venture fund? And I find that sort of third category to be extremely helpful in the building process of the company. But also, they're willing to follow on with investments. So as you grow and move from your A round, your B round, et cetera, they'll stay with you along that process. And they'll keep connecting you with other strategics, which also can help grow the, the strategy. Yeah, so I, I'm hearing it's really important to understand their operating, the CVC's operating model and you know, kind of their ph philosophy, their approach, and also the people. And so I'm, I'm curious, all of you have um, board members, board observers. You know, tell me a little bit about what makes a great uh, board member who, who's been placed by a strategic uh, to work with you? What, what are the things that really make them shine? I think that the first, that, uh, that's, a, the, that's the personality of the board member. And the second factor is whether they are from the venture group of the CVC or from the business unit of the CVC. From my experience on the venture side, it really depends, right? There are some uh, board observer from the venture team that would be just there. And there are others that would be active and help both in insights and uh, with connections. Uh, but ideally, um, in terms of uh, the increasing the probability for partnership and for the CBC to become a client as well, uh, you would prefer the board member to be from the business unit on the operational side. So uh, the connection would be more around the product and the value proposition and not only from the venture side. Anything, anybody else to add? Yeah, I, I would just just like to say that the you know the, the very best board members are the ones that put the focus of the company as as number one versus um, their own jobs, if you will. Um, and you know the 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 thing that you have with with CBCs is is that the board member is an employee of the of the corporation. So it's there is always this kind of personal conflict of interest between you know their own corporate goals as well as your company goals. Um, we've been very fortunate. All of our board members have, have been very, you know, very focused on the success of our company. Um, but but I definitely can see, you know, as as the companies or the investments companies, they change they change their focus. Um, you know, 
know if uh, there's a good chance that the company that invested with you seven years ago based on one strategy, that strategy is no longer applicable seven years later. So, you know, maybe that corporate investor is no longer interested in what you're doing, but the board member or observer still needs to be, you know, very interested in making the company successful. So, you know, you want to make sure that they're interested in that success versus, you know, just what is the strategy of the day of their company. Um, because companies change strategies, right? And, and, and you know, what, what was aligned a long time ago might not be aligned today. So if you're looking at that and, you know, you're trying to identify, you know, should, should I take money from this investor? You know, how, how, do you, how do you scan for that? How do you pick the right investors that can do that well? I'm not sure you, you, you ever really know. Um, I mean, you, there is the, the investor that you, um, that you invest with, right? You build a relationship, right? You build a relationship with an investor. They make a pitch to their IC. They put their own reputation on the line that your company is going to be successful. So the, your, so their own success is tied to your success. Um, but time goes by, you know, people retire, people leave companies, you get new, you get new board observers, you get new board members and, you know, you just need to work with them to, to make sure it's successful because, you know, it is a very fluid environment. Um, what was very, very good, you know, a number of years ago may not be the same today. Yeah. Well, that's, that's good. And I mean, I think, you know, you do your diligence just like they do your diligence on you and you try to get the one, you know, the one that you believe is going to deliver and uh, have the most aligned interests over the long haul. So maybe just to add on the diligence side, you know, don't be shy, ask to talk to the CEOs of other companies they've invested in. And, you know, that is very telling is, yeah. you know, ask for, you know, how many investments, I mean, I guess there's two questions to ask the CVC is, or any VC, right? Whether it's a financial or a corporate is, you know, how many, how many companies are you on their boards, either an observer or a board member, because, you know, if the number is more than four or five, you're going to have a problem because they just can't keep it all in their head. And then ask to talk to other companies that they've invested in and, and ask them, you know, their level of engagement, how helpful are they, and, and so on. That's great. And, and I know several of you have not just your board members, but, you know, kind of a, a, you know, a cast of thousands of board observers. So uh, thoughts on, on, you know, what's important for corporates to know about how many board observers you can manage? <laughs> as a CEO of a company that has to deal with so many? And I was going to say, if they're um, a good CBC, they would know that uh, how a board observer should, I guess, in some ways behave during board meetings versus an actual board member is what I found. Um, some people are not experienced in being a board observer or some groups that are not experienced in being a board observer. They don't quite know that uh, this is a board meeting and it's for the directors of the board and will um, inject certain things that may be um, not of their, that that's something that they should not be injecting at that time. So I think it's just one of those things that you yourself need to know the difference between a board member and a board observer and how to manage that board. I was really fortunate uh, in that I had amazing board members, amazing board observers who kind of knew the difference between the two positions. Yeah, and probably having, uh, I'm, I'm sure that the best corporations also have extensive training on the do's and don'ts and fiduciary responsibilities, but, you know, that's also, uh, you know, there's a difference right, between kind of the book learning <laughs> and and the actual practice that, that is gained over time. So. so let's see, I wanted to ask maybe a couple quick questions from each of you. What do you know now about taking investments from CVCs that would change what you do in the future? Now that you've been down this path so far, is there anything that you say, wow, this is this is what I learned and this is what I will do in the future with CBCs? I could kick it off. I think uh, I, I was asking somebody's question about this, and I think it's, it's part of the due diligence process as well, is that um, depending on your aim with the CBC and whether or not you're going to partner up with them and launch with them, understanding um, how their sales org is run, uh, really driving that revenue, because really you're taking on investments and when they are buying your product, they're buying your product to resell it with their core product. And most salespeople hate selling new things. They hate it. They've been trained to sell one thing and one widget. And if they want to have to sell two widgets and have to explain two widgets, it impacts their sales. So I think the biggest thing that lesson learned was really trying to understand if you're going to try to grow revenue through the corporate partner, um, how good are they at getting their sales force 
to sell another widget that they haven't been trained on for the past five years to sell because it'll be slow going. Uh, the average salespeople do not like to sell new widgets. So if they're really good at selling new widgets, being able to stand, stand up new uh, sales org to sell that extra widget that's your widget, then I think that's going to make a big deal in how you roll out operationally. If not, then it's just a lot of noise. I want to maybe add to that. I think that that uh, you need to evaluate the potential client, right? Our strategic investors, our CVC are potentially clients and not, uh, not uh, only resellers. And so you need to evaluate whether they are a good client to you. Is there a good fit? Then I think the second thing is to evaluate them as a, as, as a venture arm. Um, uh, what Kurt said before, asking other CEOs is super important and us usually the most beneficial, right? We are we tend to be open and direct with our uh, with other CEOs, and we would give them the right uh, the real impression from them. And third, that wasn't mentioned here, uh, I think so much uh, so far. When you have uh, CVC as an investor, be ready that the person that you are doing the deal with might change. In some cases, they might change quite frequently, right? So it can happen, you know, you can change three board observer over three years. It depends really on the on what is happening in the in the corporate. So just be ready for that. Develop multiple relationships within the organization with multiple stakeholders. Don't rely only on your board observer because he might change after a few months in some cases. Yeah, that's great. Very really helpful advice. So I see Sterling and, and Kurt nodding your heads. Um, and, uh, you know, anything to add or, you, you're, you know, what, any learnings that you have that you would do differently now that you're further down the path? I, I think Maydad's comment, though, about the, the observers changing um, or board members changing um, often with CVCs is you're definitely going to see that more than the financials. Um, and that that is a, a, an issue to take it advantage. I probably wouldn't do anything different. I mean, the investors we brought on board are great. I mean, I would I would go to battle with them any day of the week. Um, and um, we had kind of, a, you know, just share a somewhat entertaining thing is that the uh, the investor that invested in this from Motorola is actually the board member from Applied Materials now. So it's the the same guy, but different different CVCs. So there is some movement, and they can stay with your company even though they're they're wearing a different hat, which I, I thought was pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah, and I'm similar. I, I think um, I think uh, I don't know that I would change a whole lot. You know, our thesis right from the start was, are we aligned with their future goals and can we learn from them? And so every investor we have, we're both learning from them. We're aligned with their goals. I think the thing that I'm learning, maybe it's slightly different now, is the timing of it. Some have more value up front to get you started in your first or second phase. And then some, you know, will have long-term value. They might bring market or customer information that, that you need once you're ready to be in market. So, so it's kind of a combination of both, but I would say I would like Kurt, I wouldn't change mine. I think they bring a tremendous amount of value to the company and helps you grow. That's great. Well, so we're kind of approaching the end here. Let's, let's see if we can uh, pull up just maybe one more piece of advice uh, for corporate investors. What, what should they do uh, to be the best investors? It sounds like you all have you know, some great experiences to share. What's what's your one piece of advice that you, you know, offer, uh, say, go do this for your corporate investors? One piece of advice. Um, I'll kick it off then. I think uh, <laughs> we're all on that one. But I think uh, it's a sentiment I think we already spoke about, which was um, get an internal champion, work with them to get your executive sponsor who understands the organization can, and can shepherd you through the different groups. Um, but also work with you to filter your innovative and thought process um, and bring that down into something the organization can work with. That's really, really important because as founders and everybody on this group, everybody has these big visions of where we're going to go and what we're going to do and how we're going to conquer. But sometimes the corporations are saying, hey, we just want to start with something simple. And so that executive sponsor can really, really help bring that down to something that they can absorb. Great. Okay. Uh, say. Yeah, I would th I would say from um, my perspective, having kind of gone through the whole uh, exit process now with uh, with CVCs who were aligned but not necessarily aligned with the non CVC venture groups, 
managing that process or having somebody who is really well informed and has um in some ways uh, the back channel to manage that process and what i mean back channel I, like kurt says like it, it's a very um small world people jump around from different groups from pe to cbc to vcs etc and we saw that as well and that really actually helped um for us in getting to the conclusion that we wanted to get to great that's awesome uh Meda. Yeah, I think that for the, you, you ask about advice to the CVCs themselves. I think that for them, you know, first understand that they should understand what, what is the nature of CVC different than uh, the general investor, you know, and, and what does it mean to be an observer? That's, that's one. And then find the right ways to source the right startup that will fit your organization. Um, either it's uh, accelerators or uh, use the partnership of other VCs. Think that that's the right advice to them, to the founders. I'm just, you know, I, I'm echoing what uh, Sterling said. They need to understand the problem or the potential challenges that the organization, the corporate, is facing, and see how their product will fit there, and not just pitch their general uh, uh, product uh, proposition. Okay, great. And Kurt, I give you the the last the last moment to uh, chime in, and then we're going to wrap up here. So. So my, my only advice, I mean, there's been great advice already, but I think the, the most important is, is just remember it's not a zero sum game. I mean, the, the corporates have a huge amount of power. The startups have a lot less. And we really need to remember is that the best corporate investors are the ones that are focused on the success of the startup and not maximizing the return of, of what they can get for the corporation. So things like rofers and, and things like that, or, you know, IP rights and things like that, all generally start reducing the outcome of the startup. And, and if we remember that we really are here to grow the pie, both the corporate investor and the, and the, and the startup, then I think everyone's use is aligned. And, and just, we, you know, if the startup is successful, the corporate, the corporate investment will be successful. Great. Well, thank you very much. I think that's what we're all here for. Uh, well said advice throughout this. Uh, the replay of this will be available on the Global Corporate Venturing website, uh, along with uh, an article that you can read about it. Uh, just give us a couple of days to get that sorted out. But um, I really appreciate all the great advice and insights from all four of our excellent panelists. And uh, you know, we thank you for your advice. Um, these guys are all on LinkedIn. Um, their, their advice has been super valuable. And I hope that all of us in Corporate Venture can kind of put these uh, pearls of wisdom to use. So thank you very much for all, for all of that. And uh, we have the next uh, webinar coming up on April 10th. It's uh, about hospital tech. Uh, what's the hospital of the future look like? That promises to be another interesting session uh, about uh, you know, the kind of the future of healthcare. And uh, do we, I would just uh, close by saying, we look forward to seeing you in upcoming Institute courses. The landing the value of corporate venturing course is the Institute's flagship course where we delve into how do you actually hardwire the corporation to deliver the value that our four CEOs just talked about and make sure that it's a sustainable process that works despite any changes in people that may occur over the long haul. And uh, we have a number of CBC investment programs coming up. We also have the GCVI summit happening in Monterey here in just a couple of weeks, the, the symposium in London, the executive forum in Menlo Park uh, in the fall. So lots of ways to engage uh, in addition to the webinars, the classes, the summits, and those kinds of things. And feel free to reach out to Liz or myself. Uh, we're here to support you. The, the GCV Institute is committed to advancing corporate venturing impact and staying power. And uh, we look forward to hearing your, your feedback, your comments, your suggestions for future courses. And so with that, it's a wrap. Uh, really appreciate your engagement, all the great questions from the audience today, and uh, we wish you well.